G'day everyone. Day 6, toroidal inductors, the basics. So today I thought I'd talk a little bit about um, toroidal inductors. Ben asked me to do um, a bit of a chat on material selection for inductors, uh, particularly core materials. Toroids are in a very convenient form of making an inductor because they're essentially self-shielding. So a toroid is obviously this donut shaped thing. It's, the material is normally um, either iron powder or ferrite and we'll talk a bit about the differences and their relative applications in a minute. But because the permeability of this material is so much higher than vacuum or air, the magnetic field associated with the inductor is confined largely to the, the core material. So in a, in a sense, compared to a solenoidal inductor where there's this big fringing field off each end of the, the turns, the toroid has a very low um, external field, so it doesn't interfere with other circuits. You can put it very close to things, and there'll be very little um, interaction with anything outside of the inductor, which is super handy when you're building stuff. They, they will couple a little bit, like if you get a turn very close to them, or you put them on a, a conductive metallic surface, that can reduce the Q by inducing losses in the core. Um, so when you're mounting them, you have, have to be a little bit careful about how you mount them, Generally, you, um, if they're on a PCB, they'll either be mounted this way with a, um, a little standoff from the board, or they'll be mounted flat, but there'll be a, a, an area, say if there's a ground plane or some kind of metallization, that'll be removed for about, about a, you know, a half the radius or so, of the, of the web thickness around it, and they can be held down by a single bolt through the middle, or I've even seen them just glued down with silicon adhesive. There's a whole bunch of different ways of attaching toroids. Anyway, material selection wise, um, there's a, a range, there's a huge range of different materials you can get. So I'm going to concentrate primarily on the ones that you'd be interested in for RF, um, particularly the lower frequencies of RF. There are ferrites used at um, VHF and UHF, and that's kind of a more specialized use, although it's probably a lot more common nowadays. For lower frequencies, the, the ones that um, you probably want to play around with at home without having pretty advanced equipment, it's primarily iron power and iron powder materials. So iron powder materials are exactly what they sound like. It's powdered iron. Um, normally it's a it's fairly exotic high purity iron that's been manufactured by reduction of um, carbonyl iron or nickel in some cases. And there's mixtures of different materials that they try to um, optimize for different properties, mainly um, the permeability and temperature coefficient and other you know loss related um, loss related uh, features I guess you could say of the core material. Temperature coefficient is a big one and many of the materials are fairly similar except for the temperature coefficients but generally the ones with better temperature coefficients happen to be more expensive. An example would be type 6 versus type 7 powdered iron cores which we'll talk about in a minute. Type 7 is, is a lot of ways very very similar to type 6 but it, ha it has a much better temperature coefficient and a correspondingly much higher price. So powdered iron, the reason why you use powdered iron instead of just iron, if you look at a power transformer you have you know, silicon steel laminations, oh, I should have bought a power transformer in to show you, but those laminations are there to reduce um, eddy current losses. So if you have something conductive in changing magnetic field you're going to induce currents in that conductive material and that will in increase the losses in your transformer or your inductor, or whichever it may be, your magnetic component anyway. So you, in any kind of inductor you have like two losses. You have the copper losses, which are the inherent you know, copper material that you make the conductor out of. Whatever gauge it might be, whether you have um, skin effect losses or proximity effect losses, that all gets lumped under, or just the ohmic loss of the conductor itself, um, that all gets lumped under copper losses, but you also have core losses. Now if you don't have a core, if it's an air-wound inductor, then the only losses then are radiation and the, the copper losses. But when you have a core, the core can be a significant part of the loss factor. Um, and the heating of the core can actually end up destroying the core. Some materials are, are far more sensitive to temperature rise than others. There's a whole bunch of material online about this from the manufacturers. Um, Micrometals and Ferrite are two particularly good manufacturers that have a lot of data online. I'll link them in the, the description. And the numbers that we're talking about and the naming scheme and the colors are primarily from those particular vendors. I, um, 
I like a website called kitsandparts.com. Um, he has uh, another website called toroids.info, which is super handy. It has a whole bunch of the data online and a bunch of calculators for making a lot of this work really easy. It's, um, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I like buying small quantities from, from that chap. It's not, um, not giving him a plug or anything, it just happens to be convenient. For larger quantities, if you're doing it commercially, obviously you'd, uh, you'd go through the normal channels. And you can get all this stuff on DigiKey or your other, you know, whatever your favorite supplier might be. Okay, so back to powdered iron. Powdered iron is literally little particles of iron. So the opportunity for eddy current induction in these small particles that are broken up and separated by a binder. So in between each particle, there's like a layer of plastic or something, some kind of epoxy that binds the core together. And that has two effects. One is to reduce the eddy current losses, and the other is to cause like a distributed gap in the core. So for a ferrite core, you might have seen ferrite cores that are used for power um, inductors, for example, flyback transformers. They have a precision shim normally or a gap in the core that's actually used for energy storage. We won't talk too much about that. Um, it has to do with saturation and yeah, we'll talk about that possibly in a later video because it's a really interesting topic, particularly in terms of um, power conversion, so switch mode power supplies and flyback power supplies. For iron powder, the important thing to know that that distributed gap, because every particle has a gap between it and the corresponding particle next to it, means that there's a very soft saturation. So as the magnetic field increases in the, in the induction in the core increases, eventually the material can no longer be polarized anymore and it stops contributing to the increased relative permeability of the core material. When that happens, the material saturates out and it can no longer help you, so the inductance of the core, uh, of the coil of the inductor drops. Drops quite dramatically, essentially back to the vacuum inductance of the, the, the winding as if it just had air or vacuum in the, in the um, core. For iron powder, that's very soft, but again, varies greatly between materials. Everything about magnetics is really super complicated and would take many hours to even scratch the surface of. But for basic use for day to day, I, I tend to use these cores like type 1 material um, is useful for low frequencies like low frequency to medium, like 100 kilohertz to about 3 megahertz. Those cores are blue um, in one common um, color scheme. They have a uh, relative permeability of about 20 and their AL numbers will be you know, correspondingly fairly high compared to other ones. So we'll talk about AL number in a minute. Uh, iron powder type 2 is, uh, is a red core. That's a pretty good general purpose core for low, um, low frequencies to medium, or medium low, low um, medium frequency and HF. For, if you think about this in terms of amateur bands, Blue would be top band, would be 160 meters. Red would be um, 80 and probably 40 meters, and then 20 meters and up would be either type 6 or type 7. So type 6 is a yellow core. It's relatively cheap. It uh, and it's good over most of HF, like from 3 into very low VHF. As a matter of fact, I've used type 6 cores at 6 meters quite a lot, and they work pretty well up there. And honestly, that most of these. Um, recommended ranges of operation are only for high Q operation. You can you can use the cores outside these ranges; they'll just have more loss. Ferrite's a little bit different, though. So type seven um, is very similar to type six. It's a white core. It has a much better temperature coefficient. So if you're making a VFO, um, using type seven material is actually super handy. Type six will probably work just fine, but if you want the ultimate in temperature stability, you're probably going to have to still temperature compensate it anyway, but use Type 7. And use a, a slightly bigger core. There's various reasons why you should do that, and we'll probably talk about that in another video as well. Um, type 10 material is the last material. I don't use it that often. I have a small quantity of it in various sizes. It's, uh, it's black, and it's useful up into VHF. Now, ferrites. Ferrites are obviously a completely different material to iron. There are um, iron oxide and then nickel, zinc, strontium or barium generally the material, the other things that are... Ferrites we could talk about again for hours, but for the purposes of this there are sort of a glassy ceramic material. Some of them are more crystalline, some of them are more amorphous. 
and the two most common types that you'll come across and probably want to use is type 43 and type 61. Type 43 materials I think is a nickel zinc ferrite. It's, uh, it's good general purpose ferrite. Most suppression to roads tend to be made out of that, at least the cheap ones. Um, for most use, the most common use of it is in a broadband coupling transformer. So generally if you want something with high coupling between the windings, um, you would use a type 43 ferrite. You would not use it for a high Q inductor. You could try, but the losses would be pretty darn high. Also, ferrites tend to saturate. They have very high permeabilities. You can see their permeabilities in the in the hundreds, like for type 43 is 800. But it will saturate very quickly, and unless you have a gapped core, which are, you know obviously a toroidal inductor is not a gapped core, um, they're limited to fairly low ampere turns and yeah, we might talk a bit more about how you actually size a core for various loss um, parameters and power levels later. That'd actually be a pretty good... yeah, I think we might do that later. Okay, so... What every... The, you know, you come in a variety of different sizes. So this is a... what would be designated as a T130 core. There's this naming scheme that, that most of the manufacturers seem to use is the T or FT. So T for iron powder, FT for ferrite then the number after that is in hundredths of an inch so this is a 130, it's a, you know, it's a bit over an inch core you can get them right down to like T12 or something they're really tiny tiny little guys these are uh, FT23-43 cores which I use quite a lot for little chokes at VHF or um, it's kind of like a, an overgrown ferrite bead really the uh, last number is the material so a type 2 is a red core, and as we said, that's sort of low HF. Yellow would be, um, you know, general HF core. It's actually not just yellow, it's, uh, they're, I think they're sprayed when they're laying out flat, and there's always a, a base colour in the, in the case of most of these. It's the natural colour, so it's this blacky grey colour, but some cores, particularly some of the VHF cores, have an additional colour, so there's like two colours, there's a main colour and a, a sub-colour. So you might have an overall yellow core that has a blue inner core colour. So there, there's a... it does vary by manufacturer. These ones, um, these are micrometals cores, so they're... they use, you know, these particular colour schemes, and it always... This is where it gets difficult. If you've got an off-the-shelf core or something you found in a, in a junk box, you're not really sure what the manufacturer is, it can be kind of hard to, um, to work out how to use it. So it's always best if you, if you want to make an inductor for a specific purpose to find you know, one that you can get a data sheet on essentially and find out what's really there. However, uh, it is relatively simple to measure the properties of a core, at least to a you know, first-order approximation, ferrite in particular. Um, and ferrite's probably the most uh, difficult one to just grab and use because most ferrites look kind of the same, they look kind of grey. So the, you can see a difference though between type 61 and type 43 ferrite. So type 43 ferrite is kind of this shiny grey colour, whereas type 61 is kind of a silvery grey and kind of matte. Uh, that's useful sometimes if you've mixed them up. So finally this AL value, you'll see most cores specified with this AL value. It's uh, it's it's in this annoying unit of nano Henry's per square turn, um, or turn squared. So, with all inductors, pretty much the inductance um, scales with the square of the number of turns. So, if you double the turns, you have four times the inductance. In this case, you can use a simple you know square root of the inductance that you want in nano Henry's over this AL value, uh, square root it, and you've got the amount of turns. So here's an example. If we wanted to make a T50-2 inductor, we look up the AL value, which is about 4.9, and then we want to say make a 2.2 microhenry inductor. Do the math, you work out, and you, I generally round, you know, it'll come out at some fractional value, but obviously you can't have a fractional turn. And this, in this case, is 21 turns. One thing you can do is you can spread the winding. So when you've wound this up, um, you can spread the winding out, or you can pull it in so it covers more of the core, and that will let you adjust the inductance a little bit which can trim out you know, any of the variation associated with not getting the exact integer number of turns that you have calculated. 
There are, there are other effects too, and the core materials themselves have tolerances on the order of a couple of percent, so it's generally the inductor won't be the precise value in the circuit, you'll, you'll end up having you know, capacitors or something to tune it, and if it's a low Q circuit it probably doesn't matter anyway. Okay, so that's, uh, that's a basic introduction to materials, their use and uh, selection. We'll talk a little bit later about more practical things, about how to wind them, um, how to uh, calculate the size, the physical geometry of the core that you need for particular power levels. Generally, the higher power or the better Q you want, the physically larger you need it to be. Um, and you generally want the copper losses to be more than the core losses. <laughs> Some people say you should try and have half core losses, half um, copper losses. It really depends on the application. It's more critical in power uh, systems like switch mode power supplies and things like that, or uh, you know RF amplifiers where there's a significant amount of current. And uh, for DC chokes, it's an entirely different thing because you've got this big DC bias and you've got then a ripple current. Magnetics are super complicated and uh, actually really interesting, and definitely not going to cover it in just one day. So I think that that's enough of the basics for today, and we'll talk about it more later. Alrighty. Um, as usual, questions in the description, uh, questions in the comment section below, and I'll uh, do my best to answer them. Reco you know, questions or, or recommendations for anything you'd like me to have a go at, um, we've got a, a fair number of ideas now to, uh, to try and get through, and uh, we're a quarter of the way there, so yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be fun. Alrighty, till next time, bye.